Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Thank you, Father. Father, we are privileged to stand in your presence this morning. We are privileged to be called sons and daughters of God. And Lord, we ask that you'd open the eyes of our understanding this morning. This Easter week, Lord, we pray that you would help us be the the church you need us to be and to grow up. Father, I ask that the hearts today would receive, that there would be pliable, pliable soil. Father, bless the church around the world. We bless every, every believer and every church that names the name of Jesus. May you be blessed by us, Father. May the earth hear his voice. May he be lifted up this Easter season. And may he draw all men unto himself, as only he can do. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher, the revelator. So I humbly ask that you'd come and teach us. Open our hearts to hear and to see and to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts. I'm sorry, did I say Acts? Acts is on my mind. Hebrews. We're going to finish the ninth chapter, and it's Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is the, is the wonderful beginning of his last week on this planet as the last Adam before he was resurrected. And so Jesus is going through the gates of Jerusalem, and they're crying out, God, save us. Hosanna. Hosanna. And in the ninth chapter, we have had some rich teaching. Pastor Dan last week taught on the inheritance that we've received. My husband, Pastor Jim, has taught us well, and Pastor Luke has has taught on the blood and so many things, and we've been learning and hearing this over and over and over again. And you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And there's a reason why God wants us to learn line upon line and precept upon precept, because we don't learn the first time we hear something. And I'm in the church now 37 years, and I've just scratched the surface of learning. So we never stop learning about this magnificent Savior that we have. And we cannot hear the story of the gospel and the good news of the cross and the resurrection too many times. There's no possible way you and I as finite beings will ever be able to wrap our minds around an infinite God who has made all things. The book of Hebrews teaches us and tells us that he's the brightness of his glory. He's the express image of his person. That when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father of majesty on high. That he holds all things together by the word of his power. John introduces him and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him and by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And as the Gospels begin to unfold, and as we begin to see that God had a plan of redemption and reconciliation and restoration, as this great Gospel, this great news, this great story, the greatest story that you and I can ever be witnesses to, as it unfolds in this book from Old Covenant, Old Testament to New Testament, this book is covered in blood. Blood covenant is a most strong, intense, unbreakable union that mankind can ever know. And God chose to give his promises to us in blood covenant. And so in the book of Hebrews, in the ninth chapter, as we finish this book, and as I put on these little spindly glasses, go with me to Hebrews chapter 9. And let's see this great Savior and the preeminence of the Lord that we serve. And it says in Hebrews chapter 9, and Dan left off with the inheritance, and I'm going to start with verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. That word remission means to send away or to forgive. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And I've, if you could just circle that in your Bibles, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And so what I want to look at today, the topic that I want to bring to you today is the topic of death. And I want to speak, and the, and the title of this message is From Death to Life. And I want to speak to you about death itself and define it and define some things that you already know, but maybe just give you a little bit of a simplistic definition and then weave you into this last verse that Jesus had to die. This is Easter week. And for a Christian, if you're born of the Spirit of God, this is Holy Week for us. This is when we step back and take a step back and we take a step back from everything, from life, from everything. And we ponder and we meditate and we put our hearts and we fix ourselves on the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, I want to bring to you a message about death and from death to life because death is the last enemy that is to be put down. Death is an enemy to God. It is an antithesis to God. God is the God of the living. He is not the God of the dead. God is life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come to give you life, Zoe life, the God kind of life, and to give it to you abundantly. God is the God of the living. He would not even let his priest be contaminated by touching a corpse or someone dead. He wouldn't let Israel build their cities or their villages near a graveyard. He hates death. It is the last enemy. And we're going to see that in the book of Revelation, the very last thing to be tossed into the eternal lake of fire is death and hell. And so death is our enemy. It is not our friend. Many have lost loved ones here and have had to separate from those that they love the most. And, and we know and we experience death. But I, I want to I go back and I want to say to you, there's a reason for death and there's a reason why Jesus had to die. And what does that mean to you and me? Because when you walk out those doors, you're going to face your life again. You're going to face your week. You're going to be filled with challenges on your economics filled with relationship challenges, filled with all manner of unbelief and doubt and ridicule and persecution that will come your way as a Christian. But God says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God wants to strengthen us and he wants to establish us and he wants the church to stand up strong. He doesn't want us to be cowardly and beggarly and intimidated and full of sin consciousness. He wants us to rise up and to grow up and to become like Jesus on this earth because he came to this earth not just to save us, but to reveal to us what real humanity is supposed to look like. And if you want to know what a real human being looks like and what a real human being is supposed to be like, look at Jesus, because that's who we're supposed to be, made in the image of God. He's given us everything that we need. And so today I pray that this will be a life-building message to you as we speak about the last enemy to be put down, which is death. So be to do that, I've got to go back and explain a few things to you. And they've been explained, but I'm going to give it my way and just maybe a little simplistic. But is that all right with you? So here we are. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So we know that death is our enemy, but where did it come from? And how do you define it? And how do you define death? It says that death is separation. If there's a biblical definition for death, if there's one word I'd give you, it is separation. It says in Genesis 2:16, God said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he didn't die instantly from his body. He lived 930 years, but he was instantly severed from God. He died. He was separated. So the biblical definition of death and what death really is is separation. 
When you die, you will separate from this mortal body. Your flesh will go back into the dust, but your spirit and your soul are eternal. Spiritual death. When you die spiritually, you are separated from God. And that's exactly what happened to Adam because God said, Adam, the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can eat of every tree, but you eat of that tree. Adam, in that day, you shall surely die. Now, God, why? Listen, God is not a man that he should lie. God made the universe. He runs it. He manages it. He owns it. God doesn't need to explain himself to us. God says every word out of his mouth is filled with power and will bring to forth what he has spoken. It is impossible for God to lie. God created the heavens and the earth with the word of his power. Did he not? Therefore, when God says this is what something is, then guess what? That's what it is. He doesn't need to explain himself to us, his creation. It is law. Therefore, sin, which I want to define to you, what is the definition of sin? Sin is lawlessness. It's the breaking of God's law. In 1 John verse 3, verses 4 and 8, let's just look at that. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. What is law? What God says. What is lawlessness? Not what God says and doing not what God says. And he said, Adam, you can eat of every tree, but in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that day, whether that day was a thousand years or not, whatever length that day was in the garden. He said, in that day, you will surely die. So sin, lawlessness, is the breaking of God's law, and it brings something called death. Separation. Are you with me? Let's go on and read. Verse 5, and you know that he was manifested. He was brought forth, speaking of Jesus, to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil had sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So here we are. Satan had already sinned. He now goes into that garden. He tempts the man made in God's image. God had said to Adam and Eve, subdue, multiply, have dominion of this earth, rule it as I rule the heavens. And they were totally connected and joined to God. There was no death. There was absolute union. Are you with me? When Adam was tempted and when Eve was deceived and tempted and she gave it to her husband and the couple together, their eyes were opened, they knew now that they had sinned and the first thing they did is they hid from the presence of God in fear and now they were separated from God. So Adam died spiritually before he ever died physically. And God knew this was going to happen and he already had the plan of redemption in place for us. So God gives a promise to Adam and Eve. And he says, there's one coming. And he says to the serpent, he says, there's one coming. And you're going to bruise his heel, but the seed of the woman that's coming, the seed of the woman, he's going to crush your head and he's going to destroy your kingdom, Satan. Because Satan had taken now lordship over this earth and he had taken the title deed of this planet and the dominion that had been given to Adam and Eve and all of their sons and daughters, he now ruled. He was the prince of the power of the air. He's called the God of this world. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 says, For since by man, speaking of Adam, came death. So death came, separation came from Adam. You and I were born into a sinful condition. We were born into this disease. We were separated from God the moment we were born. For since by death man, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die. So in Christ, all shall be made alive. So Adam threw us into death, our first father. But God had a plan. And he knew that there'd be the seed of the woman coming. But God set in place in the meantime until that seed could come to the earth and rescue and redeem and buy back and die for us until that seed could come. He set in motion something called substitutionary sacrifice. And that's what we've been learning. That's why all the blood. God said that life is in the blood. Therefore, God said that there could be a substitution for man. That man could kill an innocent victim and bring that blood, that substitution, to the altar. And that blood would atone or would cover and would 
bring remission of sin, which we just read in Hebrews 9, 23. Without blood, there is no remission of sin. Are you with me? And that innocent victim, that blood, because blood is the evidence of death. When God sees the blood, it is evidence that someone has died in your place. And by right of the law of sin and death and the law of substitution, that blood can be brought to the tabernacle, to the temple. It can be brought and it can be put on that altar and it will atone. It will wash. It will remove the stain of the sin so that Israel could be near God. Are you with me? So God brings the animal sacrifice. Animals had more innocence in their blood than humanity. That's why he didn't receive animal or human sacrifice. We were already tainted. There was no life in us. We were separated. Are you with me? So God's plan was to bring forth the seed of the woman. So you know through the Old Testament and the New how God took Abraham and out of Abraham he brought forth Israel and out of Israel the 12 tribes and out of the 12 tribes he brought forth Judah and out of Judah he brought forth a king his name was David and out of David he brought forth the line of the Messiah the one that would come the one that would rescue us the one that would redeem and reconcile and restore us he brought forth the seed of the woman and Jesus came and he was born of a virgin and he came in the time of God in the season of God. The fullness of time, God brought forth his son, born of a virgin. Born under the law. Because Jesus, to qualify, had to be all man and all God. That's why he has redeemed us. He has bought us back, church. He has been the substitute for us. He identified with us. He knows humanity. It's the man, Christ Jesus, that is seated at the right hand of the Father. The God-man, all God and all man. So he redeemed, and he, he knew he was coming. This plan was set forth. Substitution. So Jesus had to die as our substitute. His sacrifice, his death, would pay the price so that you and I could not just be near God, Emmanuel, God with us. That's why he was named Emmanuel. Because in the Old Testament, Israel could only be near God. Near him, Emmanuel, God with us. God could be with his people. But you see, God wasn't content with that. God wanted to completely not just redeem us, buy us back, not just reconcile us, bring us back, but God wanted to restore us, give back all that was lost at the fall. And God was not content to be near man. He knew that if he was creating a bride for his son, if he was bringing forth the church, and that we were going to rule and reign with Jesus for eternity, that he would have to not be near us. He would have to be in us. Bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. One with us, completely joined back to us. And that meant something sacred had to be done. The blood of bulls and goats could not accomplish this. The blood of animals could only make us so holy and bring us so far. And the law that was kept as a schoolmaster... The law that God gave to Israel, the law that we've read so much about in the book of Hebrews, could tell us what was right and what was wrong in God's eyes. But the law could never give us the power to fulfill it. Therefore, sin took occasion by the law to condemn us. Sin, the wages of sin is death, and thereby it slew us and we died. Are you with me? We were separated, but God had a better idea. But God had a redemption process in place. And so Jesus had to die. And when he hung on that cross, and when he breathed his last, and when he said, it is finished, he died. They took a dead man off that cross. Nicodemus took a dead man off that cross. They put him in a tomb, and they rolled the stone over that tomb. And they mourned and they wept and they cried and they hid. And what a day of infamy it was. And what a horrific day it was for everyone that loved him and everyone that knew him. The rabbi, the one that created all things, the one that did all miracles, the one that had fed the thousands, the one that had healed the sick, raised the dead, caused the blind to see, the one that they believed was the Messiah, the king, the one that would redeem them, now was stone cold dead. And they mourned. But what happened between the time he was dead 
and the time when he was raised from the dead. Because you see, without resurrection, there is no faith. There is no Christianity. There's nothing that we have. If he's still in the tomb, then you and I are to be pitied more than anyone. Of all people, we are the most miserable. But if he's raised from the dead, if he is the resurrected Lord, then something has happened that has changed eternity forever. He had to die. The law of sin and death said you sin, you die. The law of sin and death said you sin, you die. Adam, if you eat from that tree, if you break my law, you will die. I don't want you to. I didn't make you to die, Adam. I made you to live. But if you do this, Adam, you have no idea what you're going to unravel. You have no idea, Adam, what you're going to break. You have no idea, Adam, what you're going to put in place. But Adam, if you break my law, you die. The law of sin and death. So Jesus, the God-man, says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And what happened? Let's see. The first thing that happened is they put him in a tomb and they rolled a stone. Thank God for Nicodemus. Thank God that they had a tomb for him, that he wasn't thrown into the garbage pile like the others. But God had a tomb for his son, and he had a stone that needed to be there so that there would be proof. There are 44 prophecies concerning his death, burial, resurrection. You know what a Google is? It's a number that is bigger than you can imagine or you can count. And the statistics are it's bigger than a Google number that those, prof those prophecies would be fulfilled. He's real, and this is real, folks. This is real. This is so real. So what happened? First thing that's happened, it says that... Well, let me read you something. I, I forgot the scripture. I'm so out of time, so let me read you this. I'm, I'm so scattered. I apologize. I get so excited. i got to settle down and teach. <sighs> She's screaming at me, Mom. I know. I'm sorry. How do you not come out of your skin with this stuff? I come out of my skin. Who are we that he would pay such a price for us? We, we have been paid for. We are far, we were, we're not worth what heaven paid for us. But for some reason, heaven thought we were. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. Inasmuch, verse 14 and 15, then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. Through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. So Jesus had to die because it was necessary that through that death, he was going to destroy the power of him who had the power of death. That through death, through death, he would destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Now, the devil was the one that sinned from the beginning. Sin causes death, right? Satan is the tempter. He tempts us to sin so that we die. He comes to kill, he comes to steal, and he comes to destroy us. Is that not true? So God had this amazing plan that Satan couldn't figure out because it says if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified him. But through death, he destroyed death. So what does that mean? It means that when he died, he, has, he, he descended. And let me read that to you. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Now this, he ascended, but what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the earth the lower parts of the earth. So before he went up to bring his blood, he went down. Before he went up, he went down. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So what did he do? The first thing he did is he goes into the region of the dead. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 24, but God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. So this was all a setup. It was a divine setup. And you know, just a lesson from that, when it looks like your worst day, when it looks like everything's coming against you, you are in line for a divine setup of resurrection life. When everything is dead, get ready because God's about to make it alive. God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and you killed him. That through death, 
he might destroy him who had the power of death. Now look, look what it says in verse 23, 24. But God raised him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep its grip on him. Now here's what happened. He went down into the region of the dead. It says that he took the keys of death and hell. That he stripped Satan of his power. John the Revelator saw him when Jesus appeared to John in the first chapter. He said, John, behold, I am he who was dead, but it was risen and I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. Now, what does that mean? It means that when we sin, we, when we sin, we, when we sin, we, when we sin, we. we. So death has a legal hold on humanity. Are you with me? However, they had never seen a man who had never sinned. They'd never seen anyone like this. Here's Jesus who took on sin and became sin, but was sinless. He was innocent. He had never done anything. And therefore, when he went into the region of the dead and hell tried to hold him and keep him, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, death could not keep its grip on him. And he said, give me the keys of death and hell because he was sinless and innocent. And God is a God of law and God is a God of justice. And when you kill an innocent man who has never sinned, death, you have just killed yourself. So death died. And the power of death was destroyed over mankind when Satan went into the region of the dead. He didn't just go to the region of the dead and preach to those that were in prison. But he led captivity captive. He unlocked Abraham's bosom. I believe the Old Testament saints went up with him as he began now from descending. Now he's got the keys of death and hell. He has stripped Satan of his power and his authority over mankind. That title deed that's in the hand of Satan, you're going to find that title deed in the hand of the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation where no one can open it. There's one worthy who could open that book and unlock those seals. And it is he who was dead but is alive forevermore, the man Christ Jesus, the God-man. And he took captivity captive and he ascended on high and he took his blood his God blood and he put it on the mercy seat of heaven as the last Adam and that blood the life that's in that blood where the bulls and goats could only get us so close to God now the blood of God himself who had swallowed up death now the veil was rent from top to bottom now man could no longer hide from God but now man could be in the very presence of God and now God could be inside of man what a savior we have what a salvation has been given to us what an incredible life has been offered to you and I Jesus only Jesus so having said that Let's look at the word. Darn, I wish I would calm down. I am much too old to be this excited. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For us. That sacrifice, that blood. Death couldn't hold him. That's why he was raised Death couldn't keep him. There was no legal grounds. The law of sin and death was now destroyed by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made me free from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit, by the power of God, raised Jesus from the dead, put his blood on the mercy seat. So now what does that mean to you and I? Talking about death. Talking about separation. Talking about absolute death absolute life what does it mean it means God now God now has completely done some things for us so I just want to give you in these last moments together a couple of thoughts three little thoughts about what does this mean to me because as you go out into your world like I said what does this mean to me how do I take this and put it in my life well let me give you three things that will help you three little tools in your Christian tool belt Number one, it means that I am never alone again. That any false sense of separation from God is a lie from the enemy. 
Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my hand. You are now bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, and he said in Colossians 1.27, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As the water is in this glass, so God is in me. He is not Emmanuel with us. He is now Christ in me, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit is now in me. He is now fused with my human spirit and made me alive. I am no longer separated from God, but I am joined to God. If death is separation, then God's life, Zoe life, is absolute divine union with God, which means no matter how rejected you are, how scared you are, how confused you are, how sorrowful you are, how depressed you are, how disappointed you are, no matter what life is going to throw your way, you are never apart from God. You have the entire God head at your beck and call, loving you, caring for you, giving you hope, giving you promises, giving you resources from heaven. You are not alone, ever. When everybody leaves you, he will never leave you or forsake you. When Paul was in that Roman prison and he wrote Timothy, and he said, all have forsaken me, but Demas. But the Lord stood with me in the darkest of places, in the worst of conditions, in the most hopeless of the hopeless that might find themselves on the earth. Jesus is with you, and he will never leave you or forsake you. We are not alone. Number two, I am becoming. I am under construction, and I am becoming like Jesus. This is the magnificent thing, is that humanity was made in the image of God. Humanity, apart from God, is dead, separated. But oh, joined to God, we become something we've never been. We become people we could never be. We can do things we could never do. We'll go places we would never dare dream of going, and we will have adventures in faith that we never thought were possible. Life comes to us. Look what God says in 1st, 2nd Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge this. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. They knew him. They touched him. They saw him as a man. But now they know him as a resurrected king of glory, the ruling and the reigning monarch of heaven. And he says, therefore, therefore, if anyone be in Christ. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That means where you couldn't change, where you wouldn't change, where you were stubborn and hard-hearted, where I was this old, nasty, old woman. Now God says, oh no, you're not that way anymore. I've poured a new nature into you. You see, nature's inherited. I've got a new nature in you, child. You got the nature of your bridegroom. You've got the nature and you've got the power of love on the inside of you. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You've got the will of God on the inside of you. I'll write my word on your hearts. I'm at work in you both to will and to do my good pleasure. What does that mean? It means now the Holy Spirit's on the inside of me. And when God tells me to do something, when he tells me to change, oh, where I couldn't do it before, where I couldn't say no, where I couldn't dismiss it now, if I take a step with him, now I've got the grace of God, the power of God in me to do what his truth demands of me. I'm a new creation. I'm never alone. I am becoming like Jesus. And number three, I will no longer be in fear of death. It is the last fear of mankind. Hebrews 2, let me read it to you again. Chapter, four, chapter 2, verses 14. Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he had to die, innocent, so that he could take the, key, the keys of death and hell. He might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He had to strip him of his power and release, and release, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now he's released us. The last and the greatest fear is death. How am I going to die? What's going to happen? What about me? You see, death has gripped us all and now it's completely taken away. For a Christian, death no longer exists. You have passed from death to life, 
and you are now in eternal life. Let me re- finish with a story. What does that mean? Because I know you're thinking, huh? What does that mean? Listen, we think we're in the land of the living right now. We're in the land of the dying right now. And we are on our way to the land of the living. When we die, when we separate from these fleshly bodies, we go instantly to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But let me read you, and let me end this thought with this story. It's written by a man named Donald Barnhouse, and it's a true story, and he'd lost his wife. And he writes this. He was a pastor. I was driving with my children to my wife's funeral when I was to preach the sermon. As we came into one small town, there strode down in front of us a truck that came to a stop at the red light. It was the biggest truck I'd ever saw in my life, and the sun was shining on it just at the right angle that took its shadow and spread it across the snow on the field. As the shadow covered that field, I said, look, children, at that truck, and look at its shadow. If you had to be run over, which which would you rather be run over by? Would you rather be run over by the truck or by the shadow? My youngest child said the shadow couldn't hurt anybody. I said, that's right. I continued, and death is a truck but the shadow is all that ever touches the Christian. The truck ran over the Lord Jesus, but only the shadow has gone over mom. David wrote and said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou art with me. For us as believers, the last great fear, dying, separating from these bodies, no longer needs to grip us and hold us. Because all we'll be doing is just going through the entrance of the valley of the shadow of death. And we won't go alone. God will be with us. And there's an entrance and there is an exit. And beloved, on the other side is absolute life, absolute delight, absolute salvation, and the full redemption of which we eagerly wait. So through death, he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. We are never alone. We are becoming like Jesus. And the fear of death no longer has to rule us or grip us. Believers, you are on a journey here on earth time. You're in a parenthesis of time. But eternity is already in you. You have already entered into absolute eternal life. Maybe because I'm getting older and am now a senior and my, my folks are still with me, I'm conscious of, of people talking about this. My dad says everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. It's the last fear, like I just said, to release those who through fear of death. You know, Jesus didn't make us to die. He made us to live. That's why the human race fights so hard to live. Even our bodies and our cellular structure renews itself every seven years. God made us to live, but not in this fallen state. There's only one way to live forever, and that's with Jesus. And you're here today. Maybe you're visiting. Maybe you didn't expect any of this, but God brought you here for a divine encounter. Because There's only one way to live, and there's only one way to live forever, and it's in Jesus. Well, what does that mean? It means that because we were born into sin, the wages of sin is death. Because we were born into this condition, we had to have a Savior. And that Savior, who has already died for us and already paid the price for us, now as human beings, in our generation, every generation has to do this, each one individually. Now we have to make the choice of how we're going to live. Am I going to live with God or am I going to live for myself? And you see, what makes you think you're going to get into God's heaven living for yourself and living your way? If sin is not doing what God says, and if sin brings death, then there's only one way for me to live, and that's to do God's way with God's will. And there's only one way I can do that, through Jesus. You can't save yourself. Can you raise yourself from the dead? You can't hold your breath for five minutes to keep yourself alive. So when the grave claims you, and it will, all of us, it's appointed once for man to die, and then judgment, every one of us is going to die. Every one of us is going to separate from these bodies. Where are you going to spend eternity? 
Are you going to spend eternity with God in heaven? Or are you going to spend eternity with hell? In hell with Satan and his angels? Where are you headed? And it doesn't matter what you think. Because what you think, if it's not what God thinks, it's wrong. God went to such lengths to save us. He brought his son to save us. So where are you with Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? Because when you die, you are going to face God and God's going to ask you one question. He's going to ask you, what have you done with my son? What have you done? And beloved, here at this church at the rock, we are believers. We have said yes to salvation. What does that mean? It means that each one of us in our own way at different times has faced the fact that we are sinners that need a savior. Number one. We have had to look at that cross and realize that God's way of salvation to get us to him isn't the way I think it should be. It's what God did. Sent his son to die through death. He might destroy death. That sacrifice, Jesus said, if you will believe on me, as I am lifted up, as I'm on that cross, if you'll look to that cross, and here's how you get saved. You believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. And that he is who he says he is. First, got to believe it. And then you surrender your life to it. And you say, Lord, I may be a mess, but Lord, I need you. And I want you to change me and come into my life and be my Savior and be my Lord. So many years ago, when I was a young woman, I did that after being in a drug habit and, and living with a man that was a drug dealer. I was the biggest mess that you could ever imagine. And yet, there was a time when I went to that cross and I saw him and I knew that he was who he said he was and I turned my heart from my own way to his way and I said God I'm not worthy I don't deserve you but Lord if you'll take me be my savior and be my Lord and I cannot tell you how it happens but this miracle of rebirth this miracle of salvation God comes into your life he begins to transform you from the inside out things are never the same you are born of the Spirit of God and if you've never surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus on this Palm Sunday you are here by divine appointment by the Holy Spirit and God has brought you here so that you can say yes to Jesus because right now I'm gonna invite you right now to come and get right with God if you're not right with God if you're not right with God if you need to surrender your heart and your life to him letting him be Savior and letting him be Lord right now God is asking you to say yes to Jesus If you need to get right with God, I want you to just lift your hand right now in this auditorium and let me see where you are. Right now, just lift your hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. Oh, I know there's there's many of you. There's at least 35 of you in this room that need to get right with God. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Come on. You've got today, but you don't have tomorrow. Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you surrendered all of your heart and all of your life? Have you let him be Savior and Lord? If you haven't and you know this is God, then lift your hand. And are you ready to make a change? Are you ready to say yes to Jesus? Who are you in this place? I see that hand. Anybody else? I'd like us to stand. And as we stand, if you raised your hand or you didn't and you should have, I want you to slip out of your seats. And I want you to meet me right here at the altar. Being saved is not a religious ceremony. Being saved is saying yes to Jesus. Take my heart. Take my life. I surrender. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. If you've never said that, if you've never surrendered your life, God is calling you now to come home, to come and be a son and a daughter of God on this Palm Sunday. Just as you are. Oh, and hear the Spirit. that need to come but I can't make you come but come come run down don't wait you've got today but you don't have tomorrow hell is real and it's eternal and why would you live separated from God for all eternity you give you life everlasting You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party. Yours. Jesus said, all those that come to me, I will in no ways cast out. You can't be too bad for God. It's impossible. 
This is Pastor Joel, and he's going to take you into our special place where we pray with you privately. You can join your family in just a moment, but if you'll just make a left-hand tour. I'm going to ask you to join Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.